the San Francisco 49ers gain notoriety not because they're a decent football team, but because they kneel in fiality and reverence during the national anthem. They say it's to do so to protest police violence, brutality, and racism, but if that were true, then they wouldn't be coming out and supporting gun restrictions. Gun restrictions that make it harder for people to be able to defend themselves and their communities and become independent of police. Great work on being consistent, neoliberals. So in the Daily Banter, which is a site I have not heard of until recently, put out this list. Oh, I love lists so much. You read the title of the video, so you know what it's about. The article was written in December 2012, so it's kinda old. Still, reading off and correcting lists is fun for me. I'll have the article linked in the description and the text on screen for you to follow along. On every point, I'll speed read through his writing. Or, more accurately, I'll speed up my reading of his writing. Anyways, let's do this. This myth is pronounced the most prevalent in libertarian circles and is easily disproved when you look at the history of economic development in the West and the level of government intervention in the economy. The stunning growth of the American economy in the 19th century had little to do with unregulated capitalism. As Cambridge economist Professor Ha Jun Chang notes, America was the most protectionist country in the world from 1830 up until World War II. In fact, as Chang outlines in his book, Bad Samaritans, every industrialized economy on the planet grew astronomically by strictly regulating markets, government investments, and the protectionism of key industries through nascent stages of development. As former head of the World Bank, Joseph Stiglitz, points out, the countries that adopted free market reforms under IMF structural adjustment policies all failed miserably and poverty actually increased. Gee, thanks for finally admitting that the Gilded Age and their monopolies and robber barons weren't a time of laissez-faire economics. Then again, you did write this five years ago, so thanks for admitting it five years ago. Anyways, correlation and causation. The argument that regulation causes prosperity makes no sense. Just think about it logically. Regulations are restrictions on voluntary activity. That they could nudge the economy towards prosperity the same way a rancher might herd cattle is to say that bureaucrats and politicians who will have careers whether they're right or wrong know better than the people whose careers literally depend on constant success. If so, then why are all these all-knowing politicians and bureaucrats in government rather than in the free market where they could become trillionaires? The IMF, it sucks. We all know that. The failure of a government bureaucracy is not proof of the failure of the free market. This is only true if you define profit as the only measurement of success. Take healthcare, for example. The healthcare industry in the U.S. is extremely good at creating profits, but extremely bad at delivering healthcare. In 2009, WellPoint Incorporated, United Health Group, Cigna Corp, Aetna Incorporated, and Humana Incorporated covered 2.7 million fewer people than they did in 2008, but made 56% more profits, 12.2 billion. Conversely, Britain has some of the most cost-effective healthcare systems in the world, according to a study published in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine. From The Guardian, the surprising findings showed the NHS saving more lives for each pound spent as a proportion of national wealth than any other country apart from Ireland over 25 Five years. Among the 17 countries considered, the United States healthcare system was among the least efficient and effective. The National Health Service is not designed to create profits, it is designed to provide healthcare, and it does it far better than a for profit model. Oh, come on! Are you really conflating healthcare insurance coverage with healthcare outcomes? You might get that past your editors, but not me. This is a fallacious statement. But if you want to talk about Britain's NHS, let's talk about Britain's NHS, that is, National Healthcare Service. According to NHS.UK, the maximum wait time for not urgent care in the UK is 18 weeks, or a little over 4 months. That's not great, but it gets worse. 40,000 people in the period between April 2014 and March 2015 were waiting longer than that, with some 13,000 people waiting longer than 28 weeks. And I can imagine that there are people who waited even longer. What kind of nonsense inefficiency is that? It's the kind of inefficiency that's so bad they had to mandate an 18-week waiting maximum by law. Because laws have been so effective in the past. Gee, it's almost like the NHS sucks at providing health care. Now does that mean that the US's healthcare system is perfect? Hell no. No libertarian would say it is, either. If I were to go into all the flaws of the US healthcare system, I'd be here all day. Maybe a future video, but this does not make your point. The facts on this one are squarely against libertarianism. While many rich people do indeed create economic growth in times of recession, they cannot be counted on to rescue the economy, as libertarians have forcefully argued. As David K. Johnson reported in Reuters, during the peak of the recession in America, businesses held onto their money rather than spend it. Great straw man there. Seriously? No libertarian would say tax cuts for the rich. 
They want tax cuts for everyone. And ant caps like me want to eliminate all taxes for everyone. Well, because taxation is theft. Even if your premise wasn't horribly flawed, your argument against tax cuts for the rich is that they're saving their money? A horror. A horror. Screw you, dude. It's their money. They can do what they want with it. At least if they got it legitimately. Wealth inequality is only high today because rich people write the laws to restrict competition. Again, provably false. America is a great place to live for a lot of people, but the people who benefit from the highest standard of living in the world are in Norway, a highly socialistic country. America has one of the greatest wealth of wealth inequality in the West and has over 46 million people living in poverty. Not exactly the best argument for American style of capitalism. First off, Norway isn't socialist. They don't even have a minimum wage. Secondly, what libertarians is this guy talking to? This is just another straw man. Or maybe he's just conflating his jingoist neocon friends with libertarians. While it is true that much of the population lives in a relatively free market economy in America, the overall structure of the economy is anything but free. And the higher up the wealth ladder you get, the more the government intervenes. The truth is that the middle class and poor live under the dictates of the market. If your small business fails, there is no bailout. But the rich have a gigantic government structure designed to protect the wealth from competition. The author here? He's actually spot on. I mean, he's contradicted his previous point about American-style capitalism, but here you go. Given the extent of regulatory capture by businesses and the well-documented relationship between big business and big government, where it's impossible to tell who's controlling whom, I think of the U.S. as economically quasi-fascist. Does it have capitalistic elements? Yes, but less and less. And I don't know many libertarians who would disagree with this. Now, there might have been arguments at the beginning of this list, but it quickly devolved into straw manning and self-contradiction. Better luck next time, 2012 neoliberals. Don't worry, I'm sure Hill Dog would do great in 2016.